All right, cool. Well, uh, we're here to talk about web VR, what, why, and how. So I'm going to start uh, talking. Oh, yeah, I introducing myself. Obviously. My name is uh, Wes Rufalcaba. I'm a senior front end developer at Lullabot. Uh, I have a BFA in illustration, just so you kind of have an idea of where, I, where I'm coming from, what my perspective is. Uh, I've worked a lot in uh, web UX as uh, a designer. I uh, had that as my main title for seven years. And uh, uh, yeah, now I'm just a, I just write code. Got sick of designing. <laughs> uh, and then I own a Google Cardboard, which I forgot to bring with me. Uh, and then a Google Daydream, and an HTC Vive at home. So if I down anything that's not those, then you might know my bias. Uh, so yeah, I work for Lullabot. Uh, we're an awesome company. You should work with us because uh, we're all very cool. That's, yeah, what you want, right? And uh, we do strategy design and development. Uh, so content strategy and, and CMS strategy, editorial stuff, um, all sorts of awesome things. Yeah, so. Uh, first, I'm going to start by talking about kind of VR in general, and I've added some AR stuff to this, but that's not necessarily what the talk is about, but just kind of so you understand how it fits in here. And then uh, we're going to go over ter terminology, uh, what the user experience is like there, uh, hardware, because that has a, plays a huge factor in what you're able to do and what kind of experiences you're able to deliver. And uh, what on earth should you do or can you do with VR, and what are people doing right now? Uh, and then we'll get more specifically into web VR and where that's at and where it's going. And a demo, because uh, this stuff is actually pretty approachable. So first, terminology. Um, so this is, I have no idea who Milgram is, but I thought this was a handy spectrum to have. Uh, so on the left you have reality, right, IRL, and then on the, or yeah, and then on the right you have uh, a virtual environment. So you can't see anything that's real, you're just looking at a bunch of 3D generated nonsense, right? Uh, and then in between those two, uh, you've, pr you've heard of augmented reality, uh, which is where you're mostly seeing real things, and then there's some virtual elements, and then uh, virtuality is just that but flipped. It's uh, mostly fake with some real stuff breaking in. So uh, some examples of virtual reality. Uh, this is an HTC Vive. Here you see uh, what that girl is seeing. Uh, she's, so she has two controllers you can kind of see in her hand, they, uh, sh so she can see her own hands in, in the application as they're moving and she's petting a little robot dog and when she crouches down, you know, uh, she gets closer to the image or to the robot dog which she feels like is in real space. Another example, also HTC Vive, you're defending a castle. Um, so one of his controllers you can see uh, is showing to him as a bow and then the other, his other hand is pulling arrows uh, and he's trying to prevent these little bathroom icon guys from uh, attacking his gate. Um, so yeah, just th this is obviously not real at all. This is a very, uh, you know, kind of computer-generated looking example, but you know, it's, it's completely immersive experience. These people feel like they have a bow in their hand and that they are uh, doing these things. It's completely immersive. So augmented reality, some examples of that. Oh, and actually, don't look at the man behind the curtain. Uh, I wanted to un comment something. Is that an option? No. Sorry. I meant to do this before. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Nope. Sorry. Yeah. There we go. All right. Back to my presentation. Uh, so augmented reality. Uh, so you're mostly seeing the real world and we're putting uh, virtual elements into the world. So a popular example uh, not that far back was Pokemon Go. Um, you had the option to kind of look at the world through your uh, camera, uh, show up on your phone, and then they'd try to overlay a, a Pokemon and a Pokeball uh, on the actual ground so it looked like you were, you know, that was actually in front of you and only you could see it. It's your own magical little world. Uh, here's another one that's come out with, this is I believe the uh, new iPhone, uh, being able to uh, measure things. Uh, this is, I love this, this is augmented reality is really exciting because of things like this where you can, you know, they tap the screen to start measuring and tap it again to stop. Um, so you can measure out a whole room and then, you know, export that to some system where you can then start arranging your furniture. Uh, another example, this is, uh, that, that's an actual room in theory, this is the, probably some demo, 
and then you can see what different IKEA furniture looks like inside of there. Again, really exciting. Um, it's not going to be perfect, but it's better than, you know, imagining it purely in your own mind. Hmm? Better than nothing. Yeah, better than nothing. Uh, one that I really liked uh, that uh, Hyundai did was you could pick up your iPad, point it at your open hood, and you could click through some tasks there that you want to be able to do. So, hey, I want to change the air filter. Hey, I want to change the washer fluid. You click on it, it plays a little interactive, or not interactive, it might have been, but a little video where it would actually overlay a 3D thing of, of the part that you need to interact with and exactly what you need to do and the steps. So incredibly useful. Uh, as opposed to, you know, having to follow diagrams or whatever, it actually has markers in the uh, hood so that everything should be very accurate. When it, when it shows you where the air filter is, it should be right there. Um, so user experiences and interaction types. So it's very different. I mean, you're not using keyboard and mouse or, you know, whatever other kind of interface some touch uh, or any kind of accessible interface, accessibility uh, tech interface. Uh, so first there's kind, kind of how do, you, how do you interact with the world you're in. Uh, the, m the lowest bar is the gaze or the look and press. Uh, so gaze is just, you'll, you generally have a reticle uh, that's in the center of your vision and if you stare at something for a little while then they'll assume that you wanted to interact with that and so you'll enter it or you know something will happen. In this case, this was a team photo we took, it was 360 and if you looked at people you would get their name uh, that would pop up above their head. Um, and then some of them, if you uh, can still find this thing, I think it's on vr.lullabot.com. Uh, if you click, some people have an Easter egg uh, thing that you can uh, find. Um, oh, and then also one thing with augmented reality is it has, uh, at, least, at least with the new Apple stuff, uh, when, you have, when you're looking through your device, you're able, if there's a 3D thing that's, you know, fake in the world, you can manipulate it with a touch interface. Uh, so it's similar to look and press, but a lot more uh, nuanced. Uh, you also have traditional controllers, so a lot of them will have kind of media controller looking guys, uh, or you might have a game controller or a flight stick if you're playing some sort of piloting thing or something like that, or a driver's uh, wheel. Um, but these things usually don't appear in, uh, in virtual reality except for some of these new, like this one uh, kind does-ish. Uh, and then there are VR controllers. Uh, these, one, these two specifically are very well tracked where you can do very uh, small interactions and they are tracked with uh, great precision and very low latency. So it actually feels like your hands. Um, and Vive is actually coming out with something that looks more like the Oculus ones here. So the idea is that with the Oculus one, I believe uh, that if, if you want to reach out and grab something, you go like that, you let go of the controller, and the halo around it will hit the top of your hand, and it's touch sensitive, so it knows you've opened your hand because it's no longer touching the bit in the middle. So things are meant to feel more realistic, like you're, you know, instead of you press A to pick up, because that's not exactly, uh, you know, how cavemen did it, uh, <laughs> you actually open up your hand and grab something. So here's another thing that's getting big. Um, some of the more complicated AR things, not the Apple necessarily, then maybe can get into this, uh, would be gestures. So you have something that's actually able to distinguish where your hand is, even maybe what, which finger's which, which could be really useful. And then you're able to actually interact with things in space. So this is a demo with, um, if you know the technology, it's um, the Oculus Rift, and then they have a leap motion uh, attached to the front of the headpiece, head mounted display. And uh, a, the Leap Motion VR is able to distinguish hands and fingers. So uh, a gesture could be pinky specific versus pointer specific or hand specific, uh, which is very cool. So that they're just showing in this demo that they do know exactly where all of the fingers are uh, while this person's messing around. So the next thing with VR specifically, AR, this isn't so much of a thing, uh, is body interaction. How, what, what can you do with your body that will actually translate into the, into the virtual world. The lower level uh, experiences, so uh, if you're familiar with the devices, we're talking cardboard, daydream, uh, Oculus Rift, um, you, it's sitting or standing, which means that um, you are able to turn your head. If you weren't able to move your head at all, it's not very convincing virtual reality, uh, but you can uh, also you know, stand up, look around, look behind you, and uh, there's, you'll be immersed in a, in a complete world. Uh, for something that is more complicated, uh, right now, the, the only way that this is getting done is, uh, so for room scale is, 
if I walk this way, uh, you know, in the virtual world, the world moves with me. As opposed to if I, if I have this and I'm playing a game and I walk, my body says I'm moving and my eyes say I'm standing still, which actually caused some nausea, because that's a little odd. Uh, but it, with uh, room scale things like Vive, you can actually wander around and there's demos where you're like on the bottom of the ocean, you can mess around with a fish and kick a sea anemone. Actually, you can't kick it, they don't track your foot. But um, you can yeah, mess around with things in the real world and it actually gets a lot more convincing then. Um, there is possibly going to be things where um, the headset would be able to track the room instead of external sensors having to track you, uh, which would let you wander around and, and interact inside the world. Uh, yeah, virtual world. Hardware. So hardware is a big factor. Obviously, it, it's hard to render all this stuff. Uh, takes some pretty solid uh, gear. So um, these are all sitting standing only. So uh, Daydream, this is, uh, it's on the very bottom left here. And the Gear VR, those are the two like mid-range ones. Uh, they're in the realm of $100, um, and then uh, the Google Cardboard is a specification. Uh, anyone can make it. It just says, okay, if you want to make hardware for Google Cardboard, it has to fulfill these things. If you want to make software for Google Cardboard, you have to do these things. And that way you can kind of match up. And, you know, uh, in this case, it's, um, oh, I can't even remember who makes this headset someone's headset with, uh, you know, Joe Schmo's VR app and they'll just kind of work together nicely. Um, these aren't as high fidelity as, as something like this, but they are quite good. Uh, it's completely limited by phone hardware. So um, the, the newer phones like the Pixel or have, have bits in it that are specifically for VR, um, whereas uh, the Gear VR originally had extra hardware in it to, uh, to kind of supplement what wasn't in the phone. So, uh, that's going to be changing a lot, especially now that Apple's gotten into the game. Finally, it's been years, they've bought a lot of VR companies and they finally came out with something. So that's good. Uh, be seeing a lot more interesting things. So um, the higher end headsets, uh, you're talking about having space to be able to wander around probably. Uh, you're talking about having uh, VR controllers. They range from, I think it actually went down, I should have updated that. Uh, just the headsets and the controllers and stuff, uh, those, that package is about, uh, I think, 500, or maybe 400 to 700 now. Might be a little off, and that's all American, sorry. Uh, those are the, that's the currency I'm familiar with. Um, and requires a powerful computer, so that's in the realm of uh, probably about $800 if you're starting from scratch uh, to get the computer that can power this without causing issues like motion sickness. Uh, motion sickness is usually caused from um, uh, a bad refresh rate, so you're not getting enough images to your eye quickly enough, uh, or uh, bad uh, UX design where somebody could do something that, that just really confuses your biology. Um, oh, and then the other thing it can be caused by is uh, if the lenses aren't aligned right, all of the lenses are made very specifically so that you can stare at a screen that's an inch from your eyeball, because if you just try to do that with your phone without anything, it just, it just looks like a blur. So. Uh, the, the way the lensing works, you want to have your eyes right in the middle of the lens. Um, and if they are way off, that can also cause some motion sickness. Um, so yeah, applications for VR. Uh, so uh, gaming, obviously, a lot of enthusiasts right now are into that. Uh, there's also, uh, along with gaming, there's uh, kind of experience kind of stuff that's less like a game and more like, you know, being somewhere that you couldn't be normally, like I mentioned, bottom of the ocean or defending a castle from bathroom icon people. Uh, photos are really cool. I've uh, had the chance to go to Iceland and uh, some other places and took some 360 photos with my phone, which is kind of like taking a panorama uh, on Android, but you go up and down as well as left and right. Uh, and then I can show people, you know, really cool things that are immersive and they can look around and, and kind of pick out the details they want to look at. Um, and then as well, uh, 360 video, which you actually need a special camera for. Uh, they also make special cameras for 360 photos, but um, they're less common. Uh, you can also demonstrate micro and macro scale, so th things that you can't really, you can't shrink yourself down, uh, like I've seen some educational cartoons do when you go through the human body, but in VR you could do that. You could get someone into uh, the blood flow and show them how red blood cells work. You could also demonstrate um, the, the planetary system and all the moons and all those things, so macro scale, you know, going out and seeing things that are enormous and being able to zoom in and out and uh, examine them. 
uh, tour museums, distant locations, event reenactment, things that, again, you can't do necessarily in reality for whatever reason, either it happened long ago or it's very far away. Um, and one thing that I find really cool is the therapy for PTSD, phobias, and brain injuries. Uh, PTSD and phobias are exposure therapy. So, uh, for instance, there's some apps that'll, that'll put you in a room full of spiders, uh, and you can kind of control how horrifying that is, depending on how scared you are of spiders, and you can kind of get used to it. Um, and it's, you know, it's not going to be, you know, you're, you're probably still not going to be buddy-buddy with them, but uh, that kind of exposure therapy does actually work, which is really cool. Uh, same thing with heights, there's heights apps and uh, all that kind of thing. Um, and, and brain injuries would be um, that they're actually able to focus the uh, therapy very specifically on certain experiences. It's, it's a much more controllable environment. So I can focus on specific parts of the brain. So that, I find that very, very cool. Uh, and also training simulation. So it's a lot easier uh, to, if you're going to train someone to work on a nuclear reactor, there might be multiple ways consoles could be set up. Having to set up physical consoles for that could be very difficult and costly. Um, same thing with maybe uh, certain kind of flight applications like NASA or you know, uh, military or whatever. Um, if you can uh, have a convincing virtual reality experience, that might be a good way to get people trained up on all sorts of different things, uh, as well as having them train on physical devices. So that was all just kind of VR in general, and AR. Uh, so web VR. Web VR is very interesting. So the, the biggest strength of the web, as usual, is uh, you don't have to install software. There is no app. You just, you know, most of your devices come with a browser and you go to a thing and there's some new software experience. Uh, but you can do that in virtual reality, which is very cool. Um, so Mose VR is the biggest thing going on in this space. Mose VR uh, is an effort from Mozilla, obviously, to try and get uh, VR things into the W3C specification. What this means is that there'll be an API uh, that you can interact with in JavaScript that'll talk directly to the hardware and you'll be able to do things that uh, um, maybe you don't want JavaScript to be doing because it's too much heavy lifting. Um, so lower level system features like a, I think augmented reality, I, would just, I don't know yet, but I would assume that uh, you're, you don't want JavaScript to crunch the layout of the room. You want something to kind of just, uh, so like, AR basically would have to say, okay, there's a line here and a line here, so I'm about this high off the ground and this, that, and the other thing. Oh, and now I can place this 3D thing there. And if you have underlying hardware in the phone that crunches the room already, and then my JavaScript says, well, here's my 3D model, can you put it 10 feet in front of them on the floor? Uh, that would be a lot less work for JavaScript to do, which is not, you know, uh, something that you want to be doing a lot of uh, heavy lifting as opposed to low-level system kind of uh, stuff talking to the metal. So yeah, that's going to be, so it'll be able to talk to controllers, the headsets, uh, be able to figure out location and space potentially, uh, all these kinds of things. And uh, not only are they trying to get that in the browser long term, they're also creating libraries that let you do this today, which is very cool. Uh, and kind of assembling open source things that are assembling and helping open source things to make like uh, uh, things that you can just get started with now. So uh, one of them is WebVR Boilerplate. So this is, uh, it's a starter kit, you know, it's just a, a GitHub library uh, where, you know, it has your package JSON and, you know, everything set up so that you can create a custom application. Uh, very JS heavy, very developer centric, uh, which is fine. Uh, if you want to do something custom, this is a great way to get started uh, if you're looking to do WebVR. Uh, a-Frame is the other thing that they're working on. A-Frame is kind of like jQuery for VR. It just makes it a lot more approachable. So it's a, a markup language uh, where all the tags start with A dash. So there's A dash box, A dash camera, that kind of thing. Uh, and then JavaScript will, when the page loads, JavaScript will take it over and make it into a VR experience with two eyes, um, two images, one for each eye and give you uh, all sorts of other cool tools like uh, being able to move around or being able to have a pointer or uh, also gives you a reticle and, and the notion of click and hover and all these kinds of things. Um, so uh, the other thing is that it can be further mod modified with JavaScript. It's not like this is a out of the box untouchable thing. Uh, somebody who, uh, you know, if you have a, more of a, uh, a design light front end kind of person start something, a uh, more focused JavaScript developer could pick it up and do more complex functionality with what the more design-oriented person started, uh, which is very cool. And then the, the, the project goal for this in general is to enable more creators. So have people that, uh, that you know, more creative kind of artsy types that may not know so much code, like so they can come in and do something crazy 
and uh, uh, yeah, see, see what they come up with. So, A-frame tutorial time. So, uh, good news is A-frame docs are fantastic. Uh, it, it's a single JS file. Uh, you can set this up on CodePen, which is usually what I do. They have an official like CodePen uh, pen that you can fork. Um, and really it's just including the one JavaScript file and then giving you some boilerplate markup that you can get started with and no compiling necessary. Um, but there is also uh, libraries like React, VR, and probably some other ones that I can't think of right now. Um, so to get started with it, this is literally all you need. Um, I have my, this is linking out to the A-Frame website and getting a release that is probably old at this point. <laughs> uh, and then you uh, put in an a-scene tag, and scene is, you know, kind of a room, a thing that you want to start building on, right? Uh, and from there, you just start putting in elements. So instead of just talking about that, let me just show you that. So, oh wait, I went here. All right. So uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I have a bunch of stuff commented out, so I don't have to remember all of this. Uh, so, uh, here's an example of a box. Actually, I'll just do that. So, uh, actually, before I save that, let me show you where we're starting. So, this is this is our scene. Isn't it wonderful? It's beautiful. I just I see everything. I see all the possibilities. I see life, death. Uh, all right. So then we save, <laughs> and now there's a box. All right. Cool box. Right. Uh, oh, another cool thing about this, you can't inspect it like that. Uh, it's not that cool, but um, this is all very uh, straightforward to work with, so if you, where to go? If I change things in here, like you know, you do with uh, HTML, it just, psh, oh yeah, I totally do that. So you can write just vanilla JavaScript to interact with anything here, because it is a tag in the DOM. Um, that is being watched by uh, the code that's rendering this giant canvas element here that actually becomes the VR experience. You'll also notice here the little goggles. The goggles are if I had a headset attached to here. Oh, it actually tried. That's interesting. Uh, usually it tells you that you don't have a headset. <laughs> but maybe with Linux it's getting confused. Uh, but yeah, if I brought up this up with my phone and pressed that button, it would put it. It would come up with two eyes, and then I'd put it in my headset, and then I could walk around this space. Uh, you can also, if you're a gaming dork, WASD, W S W A S D, you can walk around in the space, and then uh, click to move your virtual head, so I can eh, 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 look down at my beautiful cube. All right, so we'll refresh that. It's no longer blue because I didn't actually make that change. So. Uh, yeah, so we'll start with a gray cube. We can also do things like uh, change the width. Uh, so now, you know, it has width height parameters. And if you're, if you're wondering, like, where did I find all that stuff out? Well, you just go to the A-frame docs. Like I said, very good. Um, so here's a nice code example. Uh, apparently, there's a color tomato. You can probably use chartreuse. That's uh, another web color that you can use uh, in CSS. Uh, imagine it's here as well. And so depth, height, width. Uh, and then there's all sorts of, if you want to get really nerdy about it, there's all these attributes, and you can kind of figure out what they're about and uh, what they give you. So, uh, go back there. Uh, and then we can also mess around with the uh, positioning of it. So, uh, moved a little over to the left. So the way these coordinates work is X, Y, Z. So uh, X is going to be left, right. Y is going to be up, down, and Z is this way, that way. Uh, by, so you, you notice by default, um, right here, zero, meaning cubes on the ground, right? Um, that I'm looking, I can see the top of the cube, and that's because by default, uh, you get a lot of things out of the box with A-frame. So you get a camera, uh, and the camera is me, and the camera is 1.6 meters off the ground. Other fun fact, uh, being American is a disadvantage because I don't know what meters are. Uh, but you all have a, head, uh, a leg up there, so congratulations. Uh, and yeah. Uh, you get other things like a default lighting source. And uh, whenever, if I just declared a box 
and I didn't give it any attributes. There are a bunch of default ones that are there anyway. Um, oh, it's probably white by default. <laughs> it's there. <laughs> Trust me. All right. So uh, another thing we might want to do is we might want to put in a ground. So uh, giving you a line for each attribute here just to make it a little more, oh, is that big enough in the back? Yeah? Okay, cool. Um, actually, I'll, I'll bump it up. I don't need that much. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so we have a nice green ground. It's 500 meters wide, 500 meters tall. And if you're thinking grounds are usually laying down, you are correct. Uh, so it's at zero, 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 but we rotated it along the x-axis to lay it down. So it's negative 90 degrees, so our ground is laying down. Other thing you'll notice if you uh, ever try this out, if you go positive 90 degrees, you won't see anything because of weird 3D reasons. If you look at the wrong side of a plane, it's not visible. It, you're supposed to look at the right side, the correct side, not the right side. Anyway, there's my cube. Oh, my cube got shorter, but my cube still one by one by one by one. I think, or, or is it two? Yeah, it's one by one by one by one because that's the default height width dimensions and I specified that. So that's weird, why do you think that is? I'll tell you. Uh, so it's because the positioning is set from the center of the object. So we're actually seeing uh, it 0.5 meters tall because the other 0.5 is underneath the ground. So if I do a little bit of this, Bam, now it's perfectly touching my ground plane. Hooray. All right. And then uh, let's say we also want a sky. Uh, so sky is an element, uh, it's a concept in, in 3D things. Uh, sky is basically, by default, an A-frame, I can tell you that it's 200 meters away, it's a giant sphere, and you generally put a, some sort of color or texture on it uh, usually clouds or something, but uh, in this case, I, I came up with a clever blue uh, before, and so now we have a sky. Um, other fun fact, um, you want to cut down on planes as much as possible. Planes meaning like surfaces in 3D. You want to cut down on uh, those as much as possible. There's a better word for that, I forget. Um, and skies, since they are sphere, have a whole lot of faces. Faces, that's what it is. So in order to make a sphere, they have to put on a whole lot of flat shapes to make it feel spherish, and that actually does slow down your application. So one easy way to cut down on uh, performance issues is to try and figure out how to not have a sky image and instead do like a cube around you, like if you're in a room or something, that's a lot less faces uh, for, the, for the rendering to deal with because it's having to cast light off of that and figure out how that should look and where it is in space and blah. Uh, okay, and then... But yeah, for what we're doing, it's fine. Um, boop, 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 boop. So let's say that um, we wanted to do an animation. Let's see what that looks like. So, huh? We're out of time. Oh, no. <laughs> OK. Well, just this last little bit. Animation looks like that. Uh, yeah, so I can uh, post, actually I think the link is in um, the, the notes, but it's in my GitHub uh, and you can take a look at it and the docs are great. Um, but yeah, there's an animation. It looks like kind of like SVG where it's, it looks like HTML kind of um, and you're just specifying things like that and there's all sorts of things you can control. So, yay. <laughs> So I know you don't have time for questions, but I was just going to state one thing, which is if you haven't looked at it yourself, the A-frame inspector, which is just a property you apply to the scene, which allows you to have a actual external view of the scene. So Do you remember the keyboard be shortcut? Demonstrating because it's probably one of the key things that actually helps you build your scenes. Yeah. Sorry. Do you remember the keyboard shortcut? I can't remember. Uh, it's Control Alt I, but you have to have the property attached to your scene. Oh, there. You there we go. Yeah. Yep. yep. That's awesome. It's the best. So you can actually drag it around. Ah. 
Yeah, uh, it is, oh, uh, if you go to, yeah, github.com slash westrov slash reveal.js, and all of my presentations are in there. Oh, um, 